Good morning, everyone. It's uh, 10 a.m. on Friday, June 5th, so I'd like to call the, the Agricultural Welfare Affairs Committee uh, meeting to order. Everyone is present. Um, declarations of interest on our agenda. Seeing none. Confirmation of minutes from the meeting of the 7th of May, 2015. Sure. Okay. Thank you. So a few items to go through as well as a presentation. I just have to read a, uh, a uh, obligatory statement prior. Uh, this is a public meeting to consider the proposed zoning bylaw amendments listed as item 5 on today's agenda. For the item listed above, only those who make oral submissions today or written submissions before the amendments are adopted may appeal the matter to the Ontario Municipal Board. In addition, the application or the applicant may appeal the matter to the Ontario Municipal Board if Council does not adopt an amendment within 120 days of receipt of the application for zoning and 180 days for an official plan amendment. A comment sheet is available at the door for anyone wishing to submit written comments on these amendments. So on to uh, item number one, status update, Agricultural Rural Affairs Committee inquiries and motions for the period ending 29th of May 2015. That the Agricultural Rural Affairs Committee received the support for information. Received. Item number two, the proposed term of council priorities for 2015 to 2018. That the Agricultural Rural Affairs Committee recommend council approve Appendix A, Section 3. So of course, this is the term of council priorities for the, the entire city and every committee will have an opportunity um, to, to oversee these, these term of council priorities. If you notice in the report, there are a number of the ones that deal with ARAC also deal with other committees. So uh, as chair of ARAC, I also happen to sit on, on the Environment Committee. A lot, of our, a lot of our strategic priorities are jointly coupled with the Environment Committee. Uh, four members up here actually sit on the Finance and Economic Development Committee. There are some items there that also have a correlation between, uh, between the two. Um, and then I know that myself and George, and uh, we, we sit on Transportation Committee. I know there are a number of items there as well. So we do have a lot of uh, pretty good representation from Agricultural Affairs Committee on the various other committees that will be overseeing these, these term of council priorities. And there will not be opportunities throughout the month of, uh, of June as these come to other committees for, uh, for discussion, and then of course to, to FEDCO and, and to Council. Um, so I don't know if there's any specific things that we want to hold on that, or are we okay to receive the report? Mr. Chair, we, I'm okay to receive it, but uh, I, I believe uh, we will be coming back uh, afterwards after we meet with other committees. As, as you mentioned, some of us sit on a different committee yep. where it has more uh, than ERAC itself, so maybe we can bring back to this committee the, the, the connection or the connecting items we have or the joint item we have with other uh, with other committees. Uh, sure, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, so the idea, I mean, we could probably have something back in terms of a presentation, but, um, but there wouldn't be any opportunity uh, after today to, to uh, alter anything at this committee, of course. We can, we can make changes at uh, other committees and, and at, at council. Yeah. I don't know if you want to get uh, Steve Box to, uh, to speak to it, I think, to confirm what I said. Chair, you're, cor Chair, you're correct that uh, now would be the time to speak to the items for ARAC. Uh, each of the standing committees throughout the month of June will have an opportunity to, to make recommendations. All of those will rise to council for the July 8th council meeting. Right. Right. So if there's anything specific that we want to talk about, we can hold the item now and come back to it. If you want to review it, like, I, we, just, we can just hold the item. We're going to have a presentation on the Rural Residential Land Survey. So if you want to just come back to this after that yes. presentation. All right. So we'll do that. So we'll hold the item. And then we'll move on to the next step. And then we'll come back to that uh, after you get a chance to look over it a bit more. So item number three, um, the semi-annual semi -annual performance report to Council Q4 2014 and Q1 2015. That the Agricultural Rural Affairs Committee received this report for information. Is that item received? Received. Perfect. So again, we have a, a presentation on item number four, which is the Rural Residential Land Survey 2013-2014. Uh, and then item number five, so we're going to hold that. Item number five, a Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw 2008-2250, uh, uh, Omnibus Zoning Bylaw Amendments. In this, this is a this is a report that goes both to planning and to to planning and to uh, agricultural affairs committee. There's three specific items that deal 
with uh, in the rural area. One is a, a minor change to the the uh, rural commercial subzone 12 zone. One is a recognition that a building was demolished in 2004. And another one is just uh, recognizing that we built a road that we haven't yet said is a road yet. So it's uh, small, small things. But there is um, a minor amendment based on a, a change that was brought forward at the Planning Committee. And I'll let uh, Councillor Blay introduce that. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. This is a technical amendment uh, that uh, was adopted by Planning Committee um, relating to uh, Document 2, uh, Transition Clause. Um, I'm happy to read it if people like, or uh, I'm happy to simply... Uh, So the only thing different from the, the motion that was brought forward, and again, it's, it's somewhat technical in nature, but the only one thing different was just a, the addition of a date, um, specifically suggesting it's uh, from June 9th, 2013 um, to June 10th, 2015. So uh, like I said, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, fairly technical in nature, and it's a motion that was already approved uh, at Planning Committee, but because of the nature of this report coming to both committees, it has to be uh, come through this as well. On the amendments? Okay, and on the reports? Thank you. So with the, uh, if it's the will of the committee, we'll go back to, to the, the survey and the, the presentation right now, and then uh, go to item two following the, uh, following the, the presentation. Good morning. Okay, Mr. Chair. Um, this is a presentation on the 2013-2014 Rural Residential Land Survey um, for uh, Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee. Okay, yes. Okay. All right, so the Rural uh, Residential Land Survey, uh, it monitors lot creation, uh, recent housing development, and residential potential in villages and other areas of, the, uh, of rural Ottawa. Uh, the 2013-14 uh, report uh, reflects uh, Council's adoption of a moratorium on applications for country lot subdivisions, and this report is undertaken every two years. Uh, from the findings, uh, country lot creation rose from 101 units in 2011-12 to approximately 135 units in 2013-14, which is an increase of 34%. Um, at the same time, services fell from 30% in 2012 to 7% in 2014. Um, the share of new units built in villages was 59%, which remains steady, uh, same as what was in 2011-12. Uh, so findings are that there's potential for approximately 10,840 housing units in the rural area, and this represents uh, sufficient housing supply for approximately three years. Uh, based on average buildings uh, rates of over the past five years. Um, so are there any questions? Just a brief presentation. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. So we do have a question uh, from uh, Councillor Blake. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, can you go back to the slide where you have the number of uh, potential lots? Yeah. So this one? Yes, so the, the 11,000 lots, that's if every possible severance maximizing land and efficiency of those severances is, is done, right? 
this is potential for within uh, country and subdivisions within uh, the, the rural area as well as within the village for just within the rural area. Okay, if, but if, if all land was severance or these are already planned lots? These are planned lots, yes. So we have 11,000? Planned, planned as well as no planned in the villages. Okay. But in the villages just planned within country lots of conditions. Okay, and planned. so within the villages this would be if land was 100% maximized? Yes, if it was, if it was uh, potentially was used in the villages, yes. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Councillor Deuce. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If you go back to the slide of the percentage, please. Yes, sir. I have a question on the severances fell 40%. Is that something in the city we're trying to prevent or just uh, application based that we don't have people applying for severances? It's, it's just something that we uh, not people applying. It wasn't that something we're trying to prevent, no. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Chair. The, um, oh, sorry, Councillor Alexander. Chair. Uh, thank you, Eva, for your presentation. But uh, when when you talk about uh, the 10,800 uh, available laws, yes. is that taken in consideration all the EP area, the the train track uh, setback, all 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 those in consideration? Is those available lot to be built? Like I know we hear, oh, we have so many available, but then when the applicant comes in, we have so many uh, area whether EP or uh, train track uh, right away, or is all that been taken in consideration? Um, it's been taken into consideration, um, except for um, in when environmental constraints areas are have been removed. Um, so if there's a constraint on the land, then that has not been included in our potential. Uh, is not included. No. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So on that uh, 11,000 number, um, I assume we're, so we're including the 3,000 potential estate lots and then I know that's in, in Richmond, let's say we have between 3,000 and 4,000 potential lots, but 2,000 potential lots in, in Manitick. So, mm -hmm. But it, are we still looking at that 3,000 number when it comes to estate lots, including the settlement that we made with Kavanaugh at, uh, prior to the official plan review last year? I mean, the, the voting on that. Do you know, just on this, uh, do you know, do we have the number on the estate lots specifically? Um, I don't have the, that number specifically. Okay. Um, can you, can you repeat the question? No, it's just that when you're looking at the, the overall number, mm -hmm. um, yes. I know that at the time that we were doing the official plan review, we looked at a number of 2,900 potential lots yes. in the rural area, specifically in state lot subdivisions um, right. that hadn't yet been developed. Uh, so I'm just trying to see if that. So those are, I mean, this includes the potential in the, in the village of Richmond, yes. In the villages. Plus those. Sorry, Mr. Chair. The report that's before you provides what the lot potential is. There, as we get into the development process on right. subdivisions, there's always things that it does come up to the point that was made by Councillor Alshantiri. There are, um, you know, there are constraints that come up that are not known until we get into the development review process. Whether it's geotechnical restrictions, whether it's environmental restrictions, whether it's, you know, other setbacks from. Uh, you know, we've got setbacks from quarry lands or, or mineral aggregate lands. There's, there's other things that do come up. So what's, what's captured in that number is a, is a potential for development. That potential um, may not entirely be realized uh, in the short term. Uh, I guess it, it, into the line of questioning by, I think, Councillor Blay, there was, uh, you know, we do have a, a lot of historically approved subdivisions that haven't had much activity on them in some time. So. Just to be, you know, clear and upfront, there are there are a number of those historic subdivisions that do count in that number, uh, you know, and, and it may be some time before those become uh, developed because of, of ownership interests, because of market realities or demand in a particular area. Uh, you know, we have seen a number of those subdivisions get acquired by uh, by developers that are intending to move them forward in a more quick or more more expedited manner than they have been or there's more activity happening on a lot of those old subdivisions in the last three or four years than there has been you know in the 25 years preceding um, so that that trend may continue um, but the, you know what's before you as far as that that big overall number is is about potential and um, it's not necessarily that we're going to see all of those lots developed in the short term 
Thank you for that, Mr. Moody. I think it would be quite helpful to see a geographic breakdown of, of where this potential is. As Councillor Moffat was indicating, there's several thousand lots in, in uh, uh, Richmond and Metcalf and, yes. and Manic, excuse me. Um, and I know when I asked this question during the OP process, I was told a grandiose number available in the East End. And when I asked for mapping of it, it was not subdivision approvals. It was not village lots, or it was village lots, uh, much of which is actu actually being actively farmed and will not uh, in the near time ever be considered for development. And it was all possibilities for severance based on 100% efficiency of your severances. So. Um, I'm not sure that those numbers are realistic, and I think it presents a false picture of the true development potential in our rural areas, and it's not balanced. It's very heavily uh, weighted on one side of the city, which uh, is not a good thing or a bad thing necessarily, except for when we consider infrastructure and the pressures that uh, that unbalance is putting on it. Uh, so I think it would be helpful to get a report back uh, before the end of this year uh, on the geographic distribution of this potential and exact, exactly how it's accounted for uh, in terms of uh, severances, uh, historic subdivisions that are not active, how much of it is actually active farmland. Uh, uh, for instance, most of the available uh, development in the village in Navin is actually currently being actively farmed. Um, and I'm not sure that that particular family has any desire to change that farming practice at the moment. <clears throat> Yeah, just to further, uh, just further now, I know that I have a, in my office I've got a map of all the different um, pending and approved draft plan of subdivisions across the ward. It would be helpful, direction of staff, if similar uh, maps could be provided to, to all rural councillors to, so that you have those identified um, as to where they are and, and, and what, the, what the, the lot count would be in that specific area so that we can see those numbers in those communities. Uh, our report does contain uh, lots of uh, yep. mapping for the villages, uh, which uh, indicates where the potential is in those villages. And we do have a larger map where you can uh, see the uh, planned applications in the rural area that uh, would be available to councillors. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll touch base yeah, later. Because, um, I, like I said, I have, the, I have a specific map that I, that's pretty, pretty key on that. And I think it would be beneficial for other councillors to have something similar. But I can touch base with you after um, and show you what I'm talking about. Any other questions on the uh, President's land survey? No? So on the reports? Received? Thanks. So back to item number two. Again, the uh, Term of Council of Priorities. So again, I was speaking briefly at, about um, what, about shared items. They are shared, all of them. So we have a couple strategic initiatives or street priorities that are shared between Agricultural Affairs Committee and the Transportation Committee, um, which include the Transportation Master Plan, of course, uh, in terms of the implementation of the Phase 1 projects, as well as uh, traffic, pedestrian, and road safety enhancements. <coughs> so those all come under the uh, Transportation Mobility section. And then under Sustainable Environmental Services, there are three that are shared with uh, Environment Committee that are Water Environment Strategy Phase 2, increasing the forest cover, uh, as well as the Stormwater Management Retrofit Master Plan. Um, those are really the specific ones that uh, do deal with Air Act. There actually are uh, only five. But, um, but those specific ones, I don't know if we have any questions on those, if we want clarity or anything. Yeah. Councillor Austin Terry. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Vox. We know a lot of the when we talk about uh, roads specifically is is fallen under transportation committee, but obviously uh, that's something we hear time and time again about the road and uh, the lack of funding, to say the least. Even. Uh, a couple of years ago, the mayor's initiative, Auto on the Move, we make a huge investment in our road. But if you look in today's budget for road, uh, it's almost $80 million less than what we had in the past. And that's creating a pressure time after time with the increase of the material cost. And the kilometer asphalt today is different than kilometer asphalt was 10 years ago. And we see we have less funding going to that area. So it's what it looks 
like it is, it is we're fallen behind even from the Omvi report, which is we used to be part of it as a city, and, and we were follow, you know, measuring the success of of our road, and now we seem like we're falling behind. I understand we did a huge step with with Ottawa on the move, but now it seems we're going backward instead of going forward. So. Where we, you know, and I know the transportation committee will be talking about this, but nevertheless, most of the roads today is is in a rural area. Uh, the yeah, the items that are identified in the appendices align directly with the transportation master plan that council had adopted. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that you're quite correct that uh, there was a dip in the uh, in the uh, allocations for road construction because the road projects were accelerated over the last term mm -hmm. uh, to uh, to minimize the uh, the uh, impact in terms of uh, transportation throughout the city while the LRT construction was going on through to 2018. But certainly an item I can discuss with you further with the treasurer and with uh, Wayne Ewell. Okay. Okay, that's fine. I mean, I would be attending transportation committee uh, meetings while and bring the same item. Now, when we talk about the store management, and uh, uh, I said it in the last council to the treasurer, and I know there's a uh, there's a review to take place about uh, the the storm water management along roads, and and I I believe uh, way back in 2003. Uh, that policy has changed on, on in this area, and I ask the treasurer, and I'll ask you again, if we are to make any changes, I'd like to address the private uh, approach, which is the, the entrance to people home in the rural area. Especially, I, I remember in West Carton, we pay a fee on, with the development charge and this at the township to maintain those private uh, approach. Uh, now, in 2003, I think the policy has changed, and in lieu of no longer taxing the, the storm water in, in that area, will just, you know, people will take care of their own car. But now, we seem we're going back to that approach, so my, my question is going to be, and I will continue asking the same question, what's going to happen to the private approach for those people who already paid the township at the time? to maintain those culvert maintenance and, and functioning. And through you, Chair, I would have to... Uh, yeah, you're on. Well, just push it. Okay, you're on. Okay. okay. Through you, Chair, I would have to I have to take that uh, away, uh, Councillor, and speak with uh, Dixon Weir and the Treasurer. Uh -huh. Well, Dixon's here, and I already I already alerted him in the parking lot, so he got a heads up than more than you did. But uh, and I know it's going to go to a public consultation, and I know that it, we're going to be speaking about this more than once. But I mean, it's not just a rural area. To my knowledge, there's some in the urban area they have the private uh, private approach, and that policy was changed. My biggest concern is if you're going to change. That policy, we have to honor the previous policy. There, I assume that uh, this will be form part of uh, the treasurer's review rate review, uh, but I, I'll uh, have to confirm that with the treasurer. I see some head knocking behind you, so. raised at council and uh, yes uh, the treasurer is aware of that and will be considered as part of that overall assessment of stormwater uh, uh, flows and management and, and cost recovery so that will be part of it uh, in terms that issue will be part of the scoping and, and allocation of costs and cost recovery for that because mm -hmm. I see here on uh, on uh, on page 126 we talk about uh, the water environment strategy, and then you talk about the storm management. So obviously, that's something uh, we're going to see some work done within 2015, 16, 17, and 18. So you're taking the road to the show about talking to the communities uh, before any changes. Am I correct? That's, that's correct. There will be a public consultation uh, 
uh, element that will be a part. Thank you. That, that will be a part of their water and wastewater rate structure. There will also be public consultation involved in those other two initiatives that you've spoken of. So uh, it will be uh, provide lots of opportunity to hear from the public on all three of those different initiatives. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shinjiri. Uh, Councillor Blake. Thanks. So just, uh, Dixon, uh, just to follow up on uh, what Councillor El Shantiri was, was getting into. So as part of this process, we will also be reviewing our service standards because I think that's the key is that we need to look at the service standards too in terms of ditch maintenance and, uh, and the private approach for new replacements. Uh, Chair, through you to the Councillor, it is not, uh, the water and wastewater rate structure is not intended to be a service level review. Uh, so that's a very important point, but I think the point that I am hearing from Councillor Al Shantiri is that there was a basis upon which certain dis decisions were reached previously, and those need to be understood as part of the go forward basis for the water and wastewater rate structure. Sure, but if we don't change the service standard, if your culvert and your private approach breaks in 2018, it will still be your responsibility as a homeowner to fix it and replace it at, at your cost. Okay, I just. That's correct. So this is not water and wastewater rate structure. It is not intended to be a a service level review and will not be. But if there were decisions that were reached previously and agreements, those have to be taken into consideration when we're looking at the basis around which services are allocated. So I, I'm, I'm, there's a bit of a nuanced difference between the service level review in my mind and the basis upon which costs were allocated previously, and I'm trying to separate those into two separate buckets, if I may. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we'll talk offline maybe. Thank you. I know one of the, one of this issue comes up, of course, all the time. I'm sure you, you're hearing that now. Um, and even I know I have an email from someone that lives in Meadowbrook that even the same thing. I have to remind that individual that in 2003, it, the private approach bylaw changed, in which makes the culvert their responsibility. Um, fortunately, I have a bunch of staff that uh, used to work for Rio Township, and they used to have a process as, as to how they did that. And I think one of the challenges that we had when we changed that private approach bylaw was that when residents take on that culvert change there is no process for inspection or for ensuring that they replace it the right way so it, for instance in Carl Goffin Yacht Club uh, we're currently doing a survey of the uh, of the ditches in terms of the elevations because what we have is we have culverts that are are installed too high uh, too low um, angled in the wrong the wrong direction so that it's almost a reverse flow and whereas if we have a new, a new installation, so a new, when you come in to apply for a, a new private approach, we do inspect those. So we do ensure that the culvert is put at the proper grade and creates the proper flow. So there are some things that we've done um, that, that, that have created new problems. And if we need, I think we need to understand uh, the changes that, that came in 2003, what the impact of those have been. And also, I wouldn't mind um, learning exactly what the cost of of the program was before. So I have to assume that in 2001 and 2002, uh, we were replacing culverts on behalf of, of residents. Um, I think it would be worthwhile for the committee members to know what were those costs. I know I'm getting off topic because this isn't term accounts priorities, but um, what, what were those costs in 2001 and 2002 of replacing culverts on private approaches? Because if that's, if that's something that we want to look at going back to, then we need to know what we're talking about in terms of in terms of uh, financial uh, financial constraints. Is that something that we can find? Because I know in speaking to the guys that used to work in Rio Township, it wasn't many, maybe 15 a year. So I'm not sure what it was citywide 2001, 2002. Uh, I can take the question back to the treasurer and see whether or not those records continue to exist. Right. Because uh, I think that's, that's information that's, that's worthwhile to have, especially if we're I mean, through other process, through this process, uh, through this year and, and next year, to understand the impact, and if we want to look at, uh, you know, using a different approach to to reinstate that kind of a program, I think we need to know what the uh, what the costs of that are. So I appreciate that, Dixon. Thank you. 
Um, any other questions on Chairman Council parties? And we have the, the environmental um, uh, portion as well, includes the increased forest cover. I see uh, David Barclays here as our general manager of forestry. Um, I know that the city has taken a, a strong approach to planting more trees, and Environment Committee and Agricultural Affairs Committee will be involved in that process throughout this term of council as well. Oh, sure, a question from Councilor Boyle on that. So just a question on the trees. Uh, the, the performance measure is 125,000 trees a year um, for the four-year period. Is that net of replacements for the ash borer, or is that uh, replacing and new trees? I'd have to, I'd have to defer. Uh, through the chair, that includes the EAB replacements. Okay, so are we going to get a report on how much EAB replacement and how much new tree cover was planted so that we have an understanding of the true balance between the two? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I know one of the key things, and we dealt with this now as Vice Chair of Environment Committee last term, um, one of the key things that the city is doing uh, in, in battling the emerald ash borer issue is that we aren't replacing... Um, let's say one species with entirely another species. So in situations in Alta Vista, one of the biggest challenges we had was that we had to go and cut down every single tree on the road. So in, in future cases, when, when we do that, we're planting six or seven different species of trees on that road so that if a future situation came up like Dutch elm or like emerald ash borer, that we don't see such devastation like we've seen uh, right now uh, with the emerald ash borer. Um, so on, on, uh, on the Chairman Council priorities, any other questions? Are we good? Good, thanks. All right, so carried on the, on item uh, number two. So on. So I just have an, an item as uh, to, to bring forward myself. Um, but I'm going to hand the chair over to uh, to Vice Chair DeRuz so that I can then introduce the motion. So yeah, let's just assume that uh, that Councillor DeRuz figured out how to use his mic and said that it was okay for me to go ahead with my uh, with my motion. So. That the rules of procedure be waived due to the fact that say uh, this is so this is a this has to do with the installation of stop signs on Pollock Road at McCordick Road um, and complete any associated works required to establish a four-way stop control configuration at that intersection. Um, the reason why I'm asking for rules of procedure to be waived is this something I've been working on for a little while, but we just haven't got to this point uh, yet. But every summer on Pollock Road, there's a summer theater camp, uh, a summer theater and swim camp. That, um, that operates and it does generate quite a bit of traffic and the proximity of that camp to this intersection uh, does cause some concern. And in speaking with residents up along entirely the length of Pollock and the length of McCordick Road, um, there is support for this, 100% uh, support for this. So essentially it's, um, um, I don't want to read the whole thing, it's a bit, a bit, but yeah. Sorry, so that the rules of procedure be waived due to the fact that, this, that the theater camp is located on Pollock will be running through July and August. And there's a desire for the four-way stop to be implemented in advance to consider the following motion. On the motion? No. Yes, you have. Just on, on rules of procedure. On the rule procedure, so okay on that, right. yes. Right. Thanks. So on, on to the motion. Um, so again, it's, uh, it's McCordick and Pollock. Uh, what's really interesting about McCordick and Pollock is that uh, for one reason or another, the stop signs are on McCordick Road, uh, whereas... Uh, technically, they should be on Pollock Road. So the, the major flow of traffic is the one that's being stopped. Pollock Road is, is, is not being stopped. So if it, was, if it was done properly, the stop signs would be on Pollock instead of McCordick. Um, but to, to do that, to, to flip them, what we end up doing is, is putting in a four-way stop for about six months and then pulling the other two stop signs. So that would just cause more confusion in the area, which is what I'm, I don't want to, uh, to achieve. So the... The motion here will call for a full four-way stop at that intersection. Um, so th just go to the, uh, the resolution that the Agricultural Affairs Committee recommend that City Council approve the installation of stop signs on Pollock Road at McCordick Road 
and complete any associated works required to establish a four-way stop control configuration at that intersection. On a motion? Carried. Any question? Carried. Do you have a question? Carried. No. Carried. Thank Carried. you very much. Appreciate that. Right. And Councillor Drews has now abdicated the chair, so I get to, uh, I get to take it back. Great job. Great job. I heard you did a good job when I was, uh, when I was uh, seconded to the birth of my, my son a couple months ago, too. So congratulations. All right, so on to the, uh, the balance of the, um, the agenda. Uh, any in-camera items? I know there's none. Uh, the open mic session. Now, we do have two, uh, two people. I think both of these individuals are new here, I think, uh, for open mic session. Uh, our, first, uh, our first member is uh, Mike Wesley. Thanks, Mike. So just press the button once in front of you. This is push, and then you have uh, five minutes. You, Mr. Chair and uh, Councillors, um, I'm here on the uh, the uh, the drainage situation. The city says I contribute nothing to maintaining stormwater infrastructure in one of the articles in this paper. And, I'm not going to get into the, the well water and stuff because that's off the deal. But I just want to bring you up to speed on uh, how I pay for stormwater. The city, uh, no, 45 years ago, I built here and received my first Hobbs drain bill. 45 years ago. So I do pay into stormwater management. This is a municipal drain bill. I paid also for my gate culvert and insulation, which carries no water, period. In 1987, I petitioned to have the Hobbs drain extension created at great expense to my neighbors and I, just to get rid of other people's water being dumped to, on us. I have since had to burn my property to keep city water off because the drain down Conley Road cannot handle the water being dumped on us. Like Tomlinson's got a, a permit to discharge huge amounts of water. They just applied for a new permit to, ditch, to uh, create more water on us, plus taggers. Uh, Councillor Moffat was at my place. He saw the berm I've made up that was, got washed out a year ago. I've since raised it another foot. This year we had no big runoff, so it's, it's still intact. In other words, when water gets onto my property, there's no way for it to get off. So stormwater management, that hub drain extension, all that, that's no use to me. What it's there for is to get rid of other people's water. An illegal diversion was created in 2005 from Flowing Creek to the unopened road allowance, directing water to Conley and Flewellen. The Robinson report uh, shows 10 times the amount of water this drain was meant to handle when they did a study. This is a few years back when we tried to get the Flowing Creek turned into a municipal drain. A larger culvert uh, was installed under Flewellen at Conley, which I protested back in 2011 to no great concern to anybody. And that's up against the smaller culverts downstream that the city did reinstall downstream, like three brand new houses. There were bigger culverts, but they put in smaller ones. Why, I don't know. Conley Road has been raised over four feet over the years just to keep it from flooding so you can see the need for my berm. We had a roadside meeting May 6. My understanding was Flewellen Road would be cleaned out between uh, uh, the Massey's Gate and Don Arthur's place. Any of the high spot and the muck that's in there. Right now, there's no water coming down because it's all held up at the Transcanada Trail. I just took a bike ride in there the other day, and the culverts are totally submerged. And on the south side of the Transcanada Trail, the beaver have it all blocked up. Tomlinson's has a permit to discharge a huge amount of water to our area, has asked for another target, Taggart also. Charge to these groups should be made to provide water outlet in our area. We shouldn't have to pay for their water. 
to get away from our place. And I do mind having to pay to provide outlet to get rid of other people's water and, and get flooded out to boot. So, you know, I've been trying at this since 1987 and still a proper thing hasn't been done. A lot of negative things have happened, like the larger culvert been put in, the diversion from Flowing Creek to uh, the Flowing Creek, or from Flowing Creek to uh, the Hobbs Drain Extension been made greater because of the wetland designation. And, uh, you know, the, this water has got to be gotten rid of properly. I've been applying for people to make a proper outlet. Somebody take a stand and do the, the right thing here. Make an outlet for all this water. Scott, yourself, you're supposed to have a meeting with Tom Black to verify that the pipeline drain can adequately hold any water going down there. The culvert at Don Arthur's place is three feet in diameter. The culvert that feeds it is seven feet diameter. How does that make any sense? Right next to that three foot culvert is a 12 foot concrete box culvert put there in the 40s. And uh, this three foot culvert, as far as I'm concerned, is a deliber deliberate hold back of water, along with not cleaning out the ditch along Fluella. So we're not asking for great things here. Just get rid of the water properly. Anyway, that's Thanks, Mike. I, I know that um, obviously myself and Derek were there yeah. uh, with you, uh, as was Chad Finley and uh, Mark Gagne and Dave Ryan. Uh, the, the flow, I mean, I think it was uh, pretty obvious at the time that the flow was not being held up along uh, Fluellen under the culvert, but nonetheless, um, Chad did uh, commit to doing some cleanouts along the Fluellen uh, road ditch. Um, and we'll have to follow up, and I suppose he hasn't done that yet, but I can, I can follow up with, uh, with Chad to see uh, what he has a timeline for, for doing, doing some spot clearing in terms of some of the, uh, the spots that were, that were raised a bit. Um, just specifically on the, on the first thing you spoke about, I think you're referencing the Stitzville News article that I likely wrote from your discussion as to paying for municipal drainage. No, I've got anything I've read is out of the sun. Okay. Oh, well, it so. must be right. Um, so... It's uh, just specifically, obviously there's a huge difference between municipal drainage and stormwater drainage uh, in that municipal drainage is, is designed uh, to drain private property. And it, you're right, it's paid for by private property owners, but it's because it's designed to, to, to drain private property and it's petitioned for by private landowners uh, to provide that drainage. So that's not really taken into consideration when we talk about the stormwater drainage, uh, the stormwater management of the City of Ottawa. Um, you look up the road from you, I know it's not directly in front of your house, but recently we would have done some, some ditching works along, along Fluellen Road um, just to the west of your place uh, as, you, as you head towards, towards Munster Road. Uh, that works, those works there would have been charged back to Environmental Services Department uh, from Public Works, which means that no one on Fluellen actually paid for those works. So that's, that's what we're talking about when we talk about stormwater management. Uh, another example, my house feeds into a stormwater drain in front of my house. Uh, Vernon is all on stormwater drains on, on, that run underneath the road. Uh, this, this summer we're replacing the stormwater management system under Rita Valley Drive through cars. Residents in the rural area don't pay for those, uh, except for residents in Richmond because they get uh, water and sewer bills, so they pay for that work. But, um, but that's, that's, that's the crux of the situation that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's best to try to, and I, you know, in any explanation, I would love to try to explain municipal drainage and the other thing and, 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 and stormwater management at the same time. Municipal drainage is quite complicated for a lot of people that, that don't, that aren't on municipal drains. So I don't want, I don't. I just want to verify. The municipal drain, the hog drain extension that I had done in 87, that wasn't to get rid of my water. That was to get rid of the water being collected and overflowing onto me that couldn't get away. We didn't create the water. This is from Highway 7 changes. Right, but it's still, it's still private property. I mean, it's still, it's still water on private property. The municipal drain is on private property. There are situations where municipal drains do go along road allowances, but for the most part, municipal drains are on private property and then are paid for by the private property and landowners. Well, I wish it would help me, but it doesn't. <laughs> That's fair. Um, so I, I don't have anything else. But I'll, I'll follow up with Chad Finley about the, uh, about the clean out along that ditch. And I am supposed to meet with, uh, I did speak to the TransCanada folks about the drainage there. They, they reiterated what Tom said, but I'll still, I'll still uh, touch base with Tom so I can go take a look at it myself personally. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks. 
so our next uh, open mic um, participant is uh, Shirley Dolan. Thanks for coming, Shirley. Just, so just press the button once, and then you're good to go in five minutes. Okay, hoping I'm on. I am, okay. <laughs> um, yes, good morning, uh, uh, Mr. Chair and, and Councillors. And uh, I want to speak on uh, two items today. And the first is uh, something you and I have talked about um, um, through, through email, and that is uh, the um, opportunity to have some of the Air Act meetings in the evening. And um, I know uh, you said it depends on the, on the agenda, but there may be more people that would show up depending on whether it was in the evening or not. I still do get um, the occasional uh, feedback from people saying that they would like to see the meetings in the evening. And there's no guarantee that there would be more people showing up then. Uh, but um, based on the uh, discussions that we had in February, following the government's uh, review, uh, there was a suggestion that we would have some in the evening. And um, I just think it would be nice if we did have some, particularly in, in the summer. So that was item one. Now the second one was um, uh, related to the, the staff uh, report uh, on the um, stormwater and, and water. And uh, I do appreciate uh, the feedback that I got uh, from you and also the heads up that uh, this had nothing to do with me doing well, so although I think we didn't understand that. Um, and also the discussion that I had, I believe it was yesterday, with Councillor El Shantiri. Um, it is becoming clearer, I think. It's, it's uh, a little bit more complex, I think, than uh, anybody thought, uh, including staff. Um, uh, so um, I, I guess one of the triggers in the report was that there was potential for uh, rates to change uh, and that it would affect uh, potentially all uh, rural residents. And in the report, we couldn't really see anything that uh, related to to us, uh, to many of us, I should say. You've clarified the fact that some rural residents uh, do have sewers, and I understand that. Um, but um, that's why I think you see an extrapolation to, well, I pay for municipal drains, I'm already paying, or are you going to be double dipping? So um, I guess um, uh, we do look forward to the public consultations. And we're hoping that uh, the report that comes out is broad enough and um, uh, clear enough that uh, people will be able to understand exactly what we might potentially be charged for because it's looking more and more like there may not be uh, a charge uh, for, certainly for sewers, but the, uh, the culverts and the drains uh, are another, another story. Thanks for that, Shirley. I just um, on, on, yeah, sorry, on the first uh, point, uh, you're right. Um, so we do we do have a commitment to to have uh, meetings in the evening uh, when when necessary. The one thing that I should point out that we wouldn't hold. I, mean, I don't think we would hold an evening meeting just to benefit the open mic session because if you look back to previous years, um, there wasn't a, a massive increase in, in open mic participation whether or not we are in the evening or, or, or in the daytime or whether we're in the rural area or downtown. But what it does come down to is, is on the agenda items. So as you can see today, um, everyone in this room, aside from yourself and Mike, and maybe a couple others, are, are our staff. Uh, so they're, 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 this, this agenda did not generate uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, those feedback. Now I get a, I get a report um, all the time from our, our, our clerk here, uh, from our, com our committee coordinator, to on every item as to what kind of interest it generates. And obviously, we, I work with our, our rural colleagues here, uh, all the members of the committee, to determine what's the interest in it, all these items. So, you know, Eli made a good point earlier uh, to me, saying that if we, you know, had a, a zoning issue or, or an issue when it relates to the, the um, waste management facility, that's a good meeting that we would hold in the evening so that we can increase participation, make sure that we're, we're available when people need us to be available. Um, but on an agenda like this, there's nothing in here that would necessarily warrant this meeting being at 7 o'clock at night versus 10 o'clock, because then all these people have to come out at 7 o'clock, um, which you don't want to pay them to come here at 7 o'clock. <laughs> so 
Um, but yeah, so there's no question that we are open to having these meetings in the evening. Um, you know, we purposely moved this meeting to Friday uh, so that we can maintain this location. We had looked at uh, bumping it up to Tuesday or Monday, but this wasn't available on Tuesday or Monday. I didn't want to go back to City Hall with a meeting. I wanted to stay in Ben Franklin Place. Um, but uh, certainly in the future, uh, we'll be looking at, uh, at every agenda whenever it comes forward, determining those items and um, basing the, the time, the start time for the meetings, whether it's uh, summer or winter, to be honest with you, um, to make sure that we're being as, as, as open to our rural residents as possible. And if I may, uh, I do appreciate having the meetings here. I know I still get some comments, why is it not in the rural areas, but I personally appreciate having them here. I think that living in West Carlton, I always find I have to drive further than everybody else. Yeah. I know that's not the, the, the reality, but it just feels like that. Especially those, so, darn, those darn VARS meetings. I mean, <laughs> So, so I, I do appreciate having the meetings here. Thank and you. and I, I can guarantee on, on the other subject um, that every member of this committee is going to be pretty, uh, uh, pretty heavily involved in, in, in the stormwater uh, process going forward as to how we do it. Um, I remember, if you go back to amalgamation time, Hempson Consulting brought forward a report that suggested there be an urban levy and a rural levy. Uh, for one, for whatever reason, the transition board at the time didn't adhere to that, and they just stuck it all on the tax rate, or on sorry, on the rates, on the rates uh, uh, budget. So, you know, why they did that, I don't know. But uh, these are things that we'll be looking at. Uh, but at that time, they had looked at a two-tiered sort of uh, sort of um, rate structure. Um, I think that's probably fair. Maybe even going to the the urban or the, the transit rate, which is a three-tiered structure, would be would probably be more fair. But uh, but we'll be looking at that as we go forward. And appreciate your involvement. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, question from uh, Councillor Drews. It's okay. I just want to uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for being here this morning. I just want to assure you, and uh, we did this speak to our resident when we change the location because it's very sensitive for our rural area. And I want to echo my colleagues' uh, concern, but uh, it, these uh, meetings when the agenda is not heavy and there is only staff, it's better, more pro productive to have it in these places. But anytime there is public consultation and anything it relate to any issue in the world, we will have it in the evenings to uh, provide to our resident convenience. So I just want to make sure you know that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. So on to the rest of the, uh, the agenda. Notice of motions for consideration of subsequent meeting. I think uh, Councillor Drews has a notice of motion. You can just read Thank the you, resolution. Mr. I got it. I'm going to get a training on that mic very shortly. So. I have a notice of motion. And, uh, you can just read the, uh, the resolution because it's just a notice, so we'll deal with it next month. Therefore, yep. a requirement through the Risen South Nation Source Water Protection Plan to complete septic inspection on a private septic systems within wellhead protection area. And whereas the Ottawa Septic System Office is equipped to conduct these inspections and will be completing them in order municipality. And where is, whereas cost of these inspections within other municipalities are being offset by provincial grants, which larger municipalities such as Ottawa are not eligible for. Therefore, be resolved that staff will be directed to work with the Ottawa Septic System Office to develop a two-year program to offset costs for private septic system which require inspection as a result of source water protection plan. And therefore, be it further resolved that a budget for this program not to exceed 50K per year to, to uh, be established within with the existing budget envelope for the rural affairs and therefore be be it further resolved that any further extension of the program beyond the initial two year require subsequent council approval. Thank you. So that, that stems from the, uh, the source water protection uh, management plan that, uh, that the three conservation authorities came up with recently. Of course, in the RVCA, there's 16 municipalities, 15 of them get grants from the province, and we don't. So this is, this is what comes from that. So we'll have that discussion uh, next month. Um, any other notes to the motion? Seeing none. Uh, inquiries? Seeing none. Other business? None. Um, adjournments. Now, just before we adjourn, we have to reconvene as quarter of vision to deal briefly with the uh, Divine Municipal Drain and uh, North of Divine Road, which I believe there's no one here for. So, um, so that'll be, that won't take long. So on adjournment? Okay. Okay.
Right? I'll just do it right now. It's gonna be quick. Well, I'm gonna talk to Serge when she's not. They should change these up. Oh, yeah, the corn was fine. Yeah, we got this crazy thing. I haven't seen Craig. I was talking to my brother yesterday, and he's got some that, um, you know, the, the corn got snipped off, and the leaves, you know, the leaves on the corn just yeah. turn brown and they wilt and whatever. But he's got some where the worms are like, have pulled the, the worms have pulled the, the dead tissue down into the ground. Yeah. But it's still attached the to the corn. The earthworms, yeah, and it's still attached to the corn plant. Oh. So it's like the corn plant's trying to grow now, but <laughs> yeah. it's. But the stuff that's pulling that is the weirdest. Yeah, thing. anyway, I'm gonna have to go look at it this weekend and see what he's talking about. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we had 28. We don't have a lot, you know. We had we had that 20 acres over at the Harvey Farm. Yeah. All right, I just want to reconvene my members here so we can. Uh, well, at least at least two of you, so I can have quorum. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, call the order the uh, quarter vision for. Friday, June 5th, 2014. Uh, for the purpose of hearing appeals under Section 52 of the Drainage Act by owners of lands of land assessed for drainage works under the Engineer's Report entitled Amendment to the Engineer's Report for Divine Municipal Drain, dated January 21st, 2015, for the Divine Municipal Drain north of Divine Road, this court will now convene under the first sitting of the Quarter Revision under Section 46 of the Drainage Act. There are no notices of appeal, if I remember correctly. That's correct, Mr. Chair. So any owner of land assessed on the engineer's report who has not provided a written notice of appeal to the clerk's office in advance of this hearing should identify themselves to the clerk's assistant at this time with a request to be heard. Does anyone wish to be heard on the divine municipal drain? Seeing none, uh, I'd just like to uh, that the members of the quarter vision receive the reports of the engineer appointed under Drainage Act entitled Amendment to the engineer's report for the divine municipal drain dated January 21st, 2015. And uh, can we, well, that's good. Are we good? Yeah. Carried? Yeah. Thank you. And the quarter vision is adjourned. <laughs>